how you've been? It's been a couple weeks. Yeah, I've been doing pretty well. Um, after our very first session, um, I got a, a roll of toilet paper, and because I thought I'd be crying all the time through the sessions, and so I just put the toilet paper roll of toilet paper on my bedroom dresser because why not the clean next Yeah. And then our second session, I cried a little, and then I never used that roll of toilet paper again, and it had been sitting on the dresser uh, for almost the past two months, and I would notice it, and then, but just blindly look at it, mm-hmm. and then today I, uh, I finally put it in the bathroom. <laughs> But I remember looking at it, at it and going, wow, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. And then it just sat there. And I didn't. And I thought um, that I wouldn't be able to do these sessions before I went to work. Because um, the first session, after the first session, I had to go to work. And I was just you know, a private wreck. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that I, first session was a lot. Yeah, and I thought, there's no way I could have these sessions with work. I was Robin and then go to work. I thought, this is just way too emotionally draining. Like, I, I can't concentrate. I just cried. Um, and then I realized, you know, how different the process is than what I initially thought it would be. So it's just kind of strange to put the toilet paper all away after looking at it for two months. Yeah. I'm going, yeah, no, not needed. Yeah, do you think, um, I gotta shut this door. Hold on. Do you think that the, uh, what you just said is really common? A lot of people say, when I came to this, I anticipated something different. And the way that I thought this was going to work, I prepared for that. And then once I started, it was totally different. Something I wouldn't have thought or I didn't even know existed. Right? And so would you say from your previous paradigm that you could have even imagined this working this way? Correct. Not at all. Don't you agree that's why you were stuck in in perpetual kind of never really getting better? Because you weren't perceiving things differently. And, that's absolutely true. Yeah. And what this took was a completely different view, viewpoint that you didn't even know existed. Exactly. Yeah, so the way you were thinking recovery would happen was coming from the old way of thinking. If I had done it that way, would you be here now, and would that toilet paper roll have been gone through? Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people... A lot of people... I knew better. Yeah, well, everybody does when they come to me. Even though um, a lot of people spend a long time watching my YouTube videos, Um, And they can get the gist of it, but what they bring to this process is their biases and their ego that they're unconsciously, they're, it's unconscious, they're not aware of. And so, yeah, so the underlying goal that you wanted served the ego. It served, you know, that old way of thinking. It was like, it. Again, it's like saying, well, with the old way of looking at it, I found the what would serve that old way of looking at it. Never thinking that I needed to get rid of the old way of looking at it. So the solution came from the idea that there is no alternative way of looking at it. So, so that solution you came to from that way of looking at it, <laughs> which would make sense. And then people bring to me, Robin will help me do that. Not realizing that it could be the way that you're looking at it that I'm going to help you change. Totally different than what you expect. Some people do not want to change perspectives. 
So they work with me, and as I'm trying to um, shift their perspective, they don't want to shift it. So they don't recover. Very interesting. Yeah. They yeah. almost get upset that I'm not willing to do what they thought I should do. You know, so they come into it with their idea of what I should do, and they're upset I'm not doing it. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to shift here. We're going to shift this whole, no, I don't want that to shift, because they get something out of it, right? Do you remember, that was kind of like our first and second conversation, what do you get out of it? What do you get out of it? You know, give it up. It sucks. Mm -hmm. And the willingness to admit that and then to actually surrender that is why things are so radically different for you. And it's easy. It's not like we're working hard at a different perspective. It's easy. Right. Especially when I realized that my perspective was flawed. Well, that's a good thing, right? Mm -hmm. And it was... It you was, helped me realize my perspective. Yeah, you told me. And you're absolutely correct. It's good news. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, you're you're one of the fortunate ones that has suffered enough that you were willing to let go of that perception and to go into a way of thinking and being that you are accustomed to. So it almost feels like you're back to being a kid again to function in this space, you know, but mm -hmm. that vulnerability is so much easier than the controllingness and the clutchingness of trying to find a solution to the old perceptions that you have. Exactly. So you're making the same mistakes over and over again. Yes. And then thinking that I'm going to help find a solution within that paradigm. Yes, with my flawed perspective, I would, yeah. I would fix it myself because I knew better. Mm hmm. And there's no, and you don't question it. It's like a, it's like dogma. Don't question it. Unquestionable truth. That's your perception is an unquestionable truth. It's, I think, the most humbling and freeing thing is to question what you think is true, question your interpretation of what's true and to be released from it, especially from your, from what you're perceiving. And in your case, it was childhood molestation and trauma, you know, um, to perceive it differently, you would have thought that you could be happy and free and recovered with that in your memory. You know? <clears throat> To That's where, true. I never, I wanted that, but yeah. I never thought it was possible. Yeah, because you think it's in the memory as you interpreted it mm -hmm. versus the memory from a different interpretation. It shifts everything. Same memory, totally different perception of it, which means your response to it is different. That's huge. That was huge for me in, in trauma. Huge. Such a more loving and compassionate view and detached view that doesn't require you, you know, leave your body or abandon your reality, which is the way you were living. You know, you were abandoning yourself thinking that you deserved it or that you were at fault based on the, you know, perception of the badness around it, not realizing it. You know, not to say that there's that's the right thing to do or the or a good thing to experience, but ultimately that it isn't really about you and had nothing to do with you, and it, that you can witness it as an observer and a witness rather than a participant that deserves, earns, or attracted it to her. It just changes everything to where. And I have seen this not just in my own recovery from sexual trauma, but many other clients who have opened themselves up to witnessing from a different perspective. I have clients, though, on the other hand, who really thrive off of being pissed. They they literally thrive or get something out of making their parents bad. They like it for some reason. 
you know, and when even asked, don't you want to have a good relationship with your parents? Wouldn't you like to feel connected? They're like, no, they're terrible people. And they don't see how their perception is why they suffer so much and why they're seeking help. Yeah, I, I can I can see that point of view. Yeah, I do too. Um, I don't think that there's so anything it, wrong with it. It's just extremely limiting. It is, and it puts it just keeps you in, on a treadmill. Yes, no, because it's in don't life. you agree? It, it, you're positioned as a victim when you simplify it. Once someone is positioned as a victim, they are helpless. It is powerlessness, and you become stuck. And so you're constantly seeking a, a source of rescue outside of yourself because you feel powerless and inherently there's power outside of yourself that might make you feel better. Right. You know, and so when we go into instead of looking at what will make you feel better about it, which is more than, that's like everybody's intention when they come see me. I just want to feel better. <laughs> they don't look at changing the perception, which exactly. removes their need to feel better. They don't need to feel better because their foundation or baseline is neutral to begin with. It's no longer negative or void. Does it resonate whole, for, for you? It does, but idea of neutrality without assigning um, good or bad to something is a very new perspective for me. Yeah, because everything constantly, even in other parts of our life, something is good or bad. An opinion is good or bad. It, what somebody says is good or bad. We're what? constantly judging mm -hmm. everything around us and then with ourselves it's food good or bad and the idea of just being neutral and not caring so much not putting so much weight into the value of something is new yeah the indifference that is um yeah. The indifference of it all, you know, that really comes from uh, being relaxed in your self and in your space. Don't you agree the whole idea of good and bad, um, this or that, the duality state of mind comes from seeking, the goal is to seek neutrality. The goal is that you're seeking a sense of safety and that's the whole point and motivation behind is this right or wrong? Because you're seeking yeah. um, a space of safety. So the idea is that good is safe, wrong is not safe. So people who are seeking safety, safety who don't feel safe as animals would be attracted to and to thinking in terms of this or that, right and wrong. Because that is in, in essence how the brain works when it is in survival trying to find safety and so we discern safety or not safe we become very hyper hyper aware of what is and what is not safe and again that perception coming out from our minds and our soul and our space and our awareness is coming from I'm not safe so once someone is in a state within themselves of goodness or safety and it's unconditional all of a sudden what happens to the need for right and wrong? There is none. Mm -mm. It's neutral. You become indifferent. And the other thing that you become aware of is, well, it's right and wrong relative to what perspective. It's all wrong and it's all right in relativity. So why do you need to take a position? So another way of uh, um, describing it is positionality, seeking right and wrong. So when you are unsafe within yourself, we're wired to have positions because that is our way of finding safety and security is from a position. And often 
Unfortunately, people attach safety to one specific position, like thinnerness. Thinnerness is a position that is safer. There is no argument. There is no lenience. It is what it is, and that is the only option, right? So that would be the, mm -hmm. a right way of doing things that people um, really kind of fixate on as if that one thing will give them a sense of neutrality, you know, which is not what it, what is also called non-duality. Again, duality is looking um, from a state of insecurity for security and insecurity. That's right and wrong good and bad, this or that, like divisions, you know, all or nothing. Um, typically in that non-duality or all or nothing, right and wrong state of survival mode, there is no lenience, there is no grace, there is more strictness, more perfectionism, right? Because rightness is perceived as betterness. Right. And so it has to be elevated above and beyond what you're currently experiencing, which for most people is pretty good. So it has to be made better than that. So if you're experiencing a sense of unsafety in a first world environment, you can imagine the expectations that person would have on their home, their car, their income, their hair, their body image all of those things that are created into survival needs. Yeah. Are you tracking with me? I am completely. Um, so the state of non-duality is a higher state of awareness, which is what happens to our brain and our perceptions when we are not in survival mode. When we are surviving and we're surviving within our own sense of capacity within ourselves. It is not dependent so much, okay? Yeah. To some degree, we're dependent on food, we're dependent on water, we're dependent on shelter, right? So those basic needs are met, fundamentally they're met, right? Yes. So then it becomes, you know, as pack animals, really the third hierarchy of need being that do we feel lovable when we intrinsically fulfill that within ourselves our need for extrinsic validation from others to calm our survival need as pack animals goes away and so what happens is we inherently are in we are surviving within ourselves because we fulfill that third hierarchy of need or survival mechanism that is conditional we fulfill it unconditionally. So what that does is it allows your brain to shift because you're no longer defending yourself from criticism, rejection, abandonment, disapproval, inferiority, failure, inadequacies, judgment, shame. All those things are no longer trapping you in survival mode. It's amazing because you're in that state of non-duality right now. That's why it's so natural to you. You're like, this isn't hard at all. It's like a natural way of being. Yeah, because we went in and took the core of why you felt unsafe, which is that you, there's something wrong with you that would attract molestation, right? Big one. Yeah. And we went into that and basically said, well, that's not true. There's nothing wrong with you. There was something that he was struggling with. That he projected onto you and anybody else who would have done the same thing. And I guarantee you he did to some other child. So it had really nothing to do with you. And what that allowed you to see is that, oh, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm a good person. You know, you clearly are as an adult at this point and have the brain development to look at your integrity and make a decision for yourself that you're a badass human. Totally capable. You don't really need anybody else. So you're fulfilling that. Once you fulfill that, it's almost like your brain's biochemistry changes, your neurochemistry changes, you're, you feel physically different. You felt that almost like within two sessions. Yeah, it did, it did make a difference. <clears throat> yeah, when you, when you realize that the traumas that you experienced, your perspective of them, when it changes, 
and you're pulled out of the looking at your life as you've been a victim. It really does change your perspective and you realize how much time you've wasted. Uh, just yeah. All that effort and energy. how bad the wrong perspective you've had of your life. Yeah, well, here's the benefit. It's not totally wasted because you're now aware of how that position, the positionality of that, and relying on other people to validate you to survive, what that does. Right. So if you think of it that way, it's like, well, you didn't waste time because it took this long for you to be open to looking at it from this perspective. And I know you're, I know you know that. We talked about that. You're like, oh, I, I wasn't ready until that moment. And I clearly was, so, you know, mm -hmm. so it took, you know, again, it's like when you don't question that perception, you're left to seek outward or external validation to secure you as a pack animal. And that means you're dependent on people's opinions, people's approval, societal and cultural ideals. To, that you have to you have to meet you have to get you have to get the approval in that environment which is constantly rising and so can you see where perfectionism then really serves that state of mind compulsivity obsessiveness it's all survival mode it's like i don't think those are things that are i think they're amazing mechanisms they just are not meant to be lived in <laughs> They were intended for famine and crisis, like, you know, major, major life-threatening situations such as, like I said, famine, um, war, shit like that, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So those survival mechanisms that are inherently narcissistic, which is self-preservation, preserving are appropriate for that state of mind so unfortunately what's happened in culture and in, is that people are judging it and making it seem um, like it's a bad thing so when I talk about narcissism it's easy for people to feel judged because of that perception when it I, I just it's a sign of someone's state of survival mode, right? Mm -hmm. And it would, right. it would be narcissistic to make it inferior, as if there's something defining and bad about that person. That would mean that mm -hmm. people have to repress, you know, their survival mechanisms to prove that they're not narcissistic, even though survival mechanisms are absolutely wired to be self-preserving. -preser and one of those mechanisms is to want to feel validated by our tribes and belonging in our pack. And with narcissism, oftentimes it is associated to being the best in the pack, right? Performing at the highest level is the only way to get validation. Your role is to be superior. So it makes sense then why in that state of mind you would be degrading of others, competing with your own family, you know, all those things. Yeah, I can see that. Because yeah. I used to feel that way uh, with my employment, too. Like, I had, I wanted to be involved in everything. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know everything that was going on, uh, people's lives. And I didn't care. I just wanted to be in the know I wanted to yeah. know all the gossip and yeah well and you're feeling at this point the integrity of that wanting to know was self-serving it was preserving it was self-preservation versus actual really caringness the so the integrity was uh, was not necessarily what you presented it to be exactly yeah, and you can probably look at it from this angle and go, oh, that's so understandable considering the state of mind you're in. Like, how do you access real truthful integrity when you, in caring about others, when you're struggling to care for yourself? It's kind of like, 
It's kind of impossible to really have genuine care for someone else if you're struggling with genuine care for yourself. Mm, very true. Yeah. And if you look at, I think, too, how this happened for you is you had to gen, um, genuinely actually care for yourself. Care. You know, care about you as a child. Care about, you know, is it really true, you know, that you have these, that you suck and you're a horrible person? Is that really true? You had to gen, genuinely love and care for the essence within yourself and this is probably the first time you've ever done that yeah it is yeah because I have spent like we discussed in the past uh, the majority of my life convincing myself that I sucked mm -hmm. yeah and you deserved that and mm -hmm. And then being angry that someone else didn't protect you, you know, the victim powerlessness aspect of this whole thing. Mm -hmm. But then again, you go in and change your perception. Do you need someone to take care of you? Do you need someone to protect you? Do you really need that? No. Because the other aspect of it was to understand that you could handle it. You did handle it. If you have to, if if you let's just imagine you die in this lifetime, you reincarnate and you go through it again. The one thing that you I would I would hope at least for myself would be that I carry with me not maybe the understanding or awareness so much, but the intrinsic sense of capacity and separateness to get past it. Mm -hmm. Right to be able to have a an awareness that this has nothing to do with me. This person is really messed up. And you know what? I'm going to get past this. This is, this is, there's, you can cope. And that is in essence through coping ability. That's what that is. God, I read an amazing article that was talking about childhood sexual trauma and how children cope with it. And it's an, it's amazing how, they, how you cope. And that, that ultimately, you know, obviously as children that you don't, you're not aware of that's what you're doing. And so you don't necessarily attach capacity to that because your internal sense is I'm not capable, even though you are coping. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So once you recontextualize it, your need for coping goes away and you're released and free from those mechanisms that don't serve you anymore, but they did to a child. Anyways. Even though we continue with it as an adult. Yes. Which often you, you know, with adults that are seeking therapy and help, they are, they don't realize that their coping mechanisms, whether it's alcohol, shopping, um, any type of obsessive compulsiveness, is still performing for the child, right? That if yes. they were to update their awareness update their wisdom, update their sense of capacity, all of it would just dissolve. There's no need. I mean, how did it, if you look at everything that you were doing to compensate or to cope, what happened when we just adjusted your perception and redeveloped a sense of capacity for you? What happened? Did we have to one by one work on releasing these Coping mechanisms, or did all the coping me me mechanisms just lose their attractor, their your attraction to them? The attractiveness was gone. Yeah, so there's no real need to pry your fingers off of it, right? Right. So a lot of times I work with clients, and they I'm prying, literally prying their fingers off of what they're doing. Right. And part of that is because they do not want to change their perceptions. They don't. They don't want to change their perceptions. So therefore, they need these coping mechanisms that they want not to have. They don't want to have consequences from those coping mechanisms, but they do. And so it's a fight for us to get them to let go, which is the only way to access a shift of awareness. Right. Yeah. So. See, you're hearing this right now, and it all is making sense to you, doesn't it? It does. Um, it 
it does make sense. And I, you know, as I've said before, I, I never expected uh, just freedom this quickly. And I expected every week that we would rehash <laughs> childhood. And, and talk about it some more. Right. Yeah, no. And how, you know, I had been done wrong, you know, stuff that, you know, I I was not, I did not want to do. This is, I don't need to sit on somebody's couch and rehash my childhood. I've done that enough times. I, I wanted someone to help me out of that. Yeah, to move on. Let's move on. Mm -hmm. And how do you move on with something so traumatic, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Recontextualization, isn't it? Isn't it amazing? We just recontextualize it, rethink it. But the other thing is for you to do that, we had to face it. You had to open your mind to re-experience it that one time. We, yes. we, we did have to do that that first session. Mm -hmm. Right. And you... Yeah, and we ended up talking about the molestation, which I didn't expect that we would talk about. I thought we would talk about my current life more. I didn't realize we had to go in. But I knew that it was all tied somehow. I just didn't know in what manner because I thought I could, I was trying to fix it all these years. Mm -hmm. Well, and Clearly. you also were willing to talk about it. There are sometimes I have clients who withhold issues that are fundamentally attached to themselves because they don't feel they're capable of facing it. So, you know, it's kind of hard to really do much shifting if they are not willing to expose themselves and express these issues. So... You can thank yourself for that. Thank you know. <laughs> and and again, if you think about it, what the desperateness that you brought to the table is why. You were that desperate and really that um, malleable in terms of like what you're willing to do to recover. You were at that point. You know. Mhm. Mm yeah, it was. It, I was in a very dark place for a long time. Yeah. And it was getting worse. It wasn't. Yeah. I saw no. Um. No light at the end of the no. tunnel. No hope. Hopeless. Uh, hopeless mm -hmm. and um, in apathy. Yeah, and so I knew that I had to reach out because my methods of trying to fix it for so many years well it wasn't working and just causing things to get worse mm -hmm. isn't that the case it, though if you if everything you're doing is to try to um, hide um, these feelings within yourself that you don't want exposed it's kind of like the more you are avoiding those feelings or trying to hide those feelings don't they just inevitably come back you become more and more vulnerable to it you become weaker to address it if you don't address it you're never really going to develop the capacity to address it so the you know in a way I guess you could say you had a moment of courage in contacting me or at least a glimpse of hope yeah absolutely yeah I had watched part of um, a 90 minute video that you had up and I think it was just within the first 20 minutes I saw and I thought I felt like you were talking to me uh, wow Okay, I need to look into this further. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, how much? How long did you watch my YouTube channel? Oh, 
it, that only it was just that 20 minutes i haven't watched um any other videos that's amazing that's amazing to me that's amazing yeah i could yeah like i i really i thought like you were like i was the person you were talking to mm -hmm. and i thought wow she she gets it like she understands where I, what position I'm in. Yeah, and then it took me, actually, another couple of weeks to reach out to you because I was nervous about having the discussions about childhood and. Mm -hmm. You're um, probably curious, unsure too. I bet. Oh. So I, mean, I didn't know, you know, I hadn't, I wanted to fix the binge eating and I knew that we would talk about childhood, that's inevitable. I, I was just so nervous about having to talk about it, like, oh, another person I have to explain it to, and, but I wanted, I was willing, though, to do whatever it took, mm -hmm. and it did mm -hmm. take me, I think, two about two weeks and um, a conversation with someone at a line dance class and a horrible situation at a Ralph's grocery store and I just thought, oh, wow, okay, and this is it. Like, you have, you're making the phone call. I was sending the email. Mm -hmm. And then once I sent the email, it was just, it was a sigh of relief. Hmm. Uh, okay, I've reached out and let's just see what happens because the alternative is not good. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. I do think it does take someone to see clearly that there is no escaping what you've been doing. Like, there is no escape. It does, to some degree, require hopelessness. And to see that clearly, that the way you're doing it, there is no escape. It goes around and around and around and around. And you can per, you can convince yourself it's different, but it's not, right? I do think that was imperative for me, too, in my recovery. The moment I realized this is never ending, there is no escape. All of a sudden, then, you're forced to look at what you've been trying to escape interesting and it might not always be what you think it is that's true but it is certainly scary and I bet you that's what you were feeling when you were like I have to do this I have to look at this and it scares me and then mm -hmm. you look at it the actual experience of looking at it is really quite simple it isn't necessarily as horrific as your mind has distorted it to be and then you laugh at yourself. Why, why didn't I do this sooner? Well, because your fear of fear really kept you hostage to your animal survival fear mechanisms of trying to get away from it. As if it was going to kill you. When in reality, looking at it was the door to get rid of it. Going into it is the exists the door to get out of it. It's like you go into these feelings and that's how you escape them. That's the most amazing thing is it's backwards. It's it's reverse of our animal impulsive drive, which is to escape, hide, diminish, avoid, you know, fight. Mm -hmm. You know, so going into it and looking at it in reality which is what we had to do because we were looking at it but you were looking at it from your perspective and I had to say well we're gonna look at it from a different perspective and see the difference and you could feel the difference and you abandoned your perspective like this exactly yeah and all of a sudden mm -hmm. that impulsiveness to escape was gone right but I need to escape I, I needed to escape that perspective so the mm -hmm. The insanity is in that perspective, in that perception of it. Sure, if I go back to that perception of it, what do you think is going to happen? What do you think is going to return? 
on insanity. Impulsivity. Yes. So that's how what... Do you, how do you keep that from creeping up? Well, you... So basically what you're saying is how do I stop believing the same perception? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> I know for me, I abandoned it and it has never crept back. But that's because it was a full and complete abandonment. I, to this day, you know, my coping mechanism was to be thinner and healthier and fit, fitter, right? This fitness body, it was through body image. And that body image was dark and demented. It served an escape, but it was dark and demented, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it would be like, well, the desire for the escape would have to return, and I would have to be okay with being in a dark and demented space. Does that make sense? Mm. So I'm to, at the point where I would rather never escape again and forever be relieved of that dark and demented space. So I don't escape fear. I live in vulnerability at this point. I have been ever since. Um, I'm even aware of my biggest vulnerabilities, which would be the death of one of my children or all of my children. Okay. Right? So I don't repress my fear of that. I live vulnerable with it. So when my daughter, who's 16, drives her car, I am not going to avoid my fear she's going to get in a wreck and die. You know, I don't repress oh. that. I don't fight with it and micromanage her driving. Right? <laughs> so I right. live in vulnerability. Oh, it's, it's interesting you say that because... Um, of the line of work I do when I have a family member that goes into surgery or they're going to get on an airplane or take a road trip my mind goes to like the worst thing that can happen to them during that episode uh -huh. whatever they're doing and, it, and it's not unusual at work we've all talked about it and it's something that's very common with all of us there and it's not things that people would typically think about. But it's just interesting you say that because I've, I've had that perspective often. Mm -hmm. I don't have children. Um, <clears throat> but I've had that with people in my life. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and the, obviously, I don't know if that is, I think that's actual part of our wiring is to be, be, perceive risk and danger. The difference is people's willingness to exist in that and knowing that it is, there is no escaping death. Death is inevitable. And when it's time, it's time. And, you know, you can either live your life or you can spend your life um, avoiding death. So, you know, I personally am not afraid to die, and I was pr prior to, you know, recovery, like, deathly afraid um, of, of death. Um, but, I, ha I, you know, after having that out-of-body experience, to me, it's like nothing. So, but the experience of the grief of the death of a child, to me, is something that is a vulnerability for me. So, again, you, the difference is someone, like, for example, if I often have a, a few, I, every time I get in an airplane, I recognize the probability that if we get in a plane crash, I'm going to die, right? So it's 100%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, and the probability of getting a plane crash is very small compared to a car crash. However, the probability oh, of death completely. is 100%. But either way, my it's kind of hard not to go into I could die, especially because I'm afraid of heights. I have this weird height thing. I'm going to crash to my death. So I'm a, I think that's more the vulnerability that's in there. And I accept I'm going to die. I go into it. If this is the way I go, okay. Every time I get in a plane, I accept this is the way I'm going to go. Every time I get in a car and I'm driving long distance, I accept this is the way I'm going to go. Because I don't want to be held hostage by my fear of it. 
So the willingness to accept, that's what changes things. Doesn't mean that I don't wear a seatbelt or that I, right? Right. <laughs> I'm not speeding around corners or when the, the roads are bad. It just means that if I'm doing the best I can with what I'm aware of within this range of safety that I'm aware of and I die, I die. I'm, and I, that's the way it rolls. Mm -hmm. And I can accept that ahead of time. So it really changes how the animal aspect of our need to live and stay alive impacts our life. Some people are so afraid they stop living. They live in total paralysis. Mm -hmm. You know, being having to, you know, uh, research every disease and how food impacts disease as that becomes their way of living. And it's all based on fear of death. So they're not really living. They're trying to defend themselves from death. That's really common in medical, in the uh, weight loss, you know, health dieting environment. Uh -huh. but because they talk about health, because your health is so bad. Because disease it will kill you. Yes. So they're mm -hmm. triggering mm -hmm. fear of death. And then people get sucked into this whole concept of prevention, which actually is what, you know, if you're constantly trying to remove fear of death, that becomes your life. Because that's, again, survival mode. The only way to escape survival mode is to feel competent, internally competent. To feel that you can handle death. Can I handle death? Your answer is no. How can you get out of it? Oh, okay. That's interesting. Just another layer of it all. Yeah, when you look at it, that's what's underneath mm -hmm. all of it. That's what's underneath this whole mess is our animal drive to stay alive. Pretty sure there's no escaping that unless you're willing to die and you're okay dying. Once someone is okay with death, well, then I might as well just do what I want to do while I'm here. So they all of a sudden start to live again. Uh, can you repeat that? Um, once someone accepts death and that it is inevitable and they stop being afraid of death, um, which really comes down to their feel of their fear of not being me, which is the ego. Mm, okay. Once they let that go, all of a sudden, people once people release the fear of death, they begin to exist and start to live again. Um, because they're no longer, their life and life energy is no longer devoted to defending themselves from death. And they start to live, you know, expressively and creatively. Because they've already accepted death and they're not afraid of death. So their mind opens up to these higher states of awareness and where we can access more creativity, open mindedness and other benefits of being a human. Mm, okay. Which is where you're at. You're feeling those benefits. Yes. You could say yeah. to some degree you you are not afraid to die. To some degree you've accessed a sense that you are okay with death. You're okay with abandonment. You're okay with rejection. You're okay with disapproval. Those are all things that in the brain symbolize death. And our inherent survival mechanisms around being a tribal pack animal. Right? Yeah. You're not afraid to starve. There's plenty of food. You know, you have everything that you need to survive to access everything that you need to hit those kind of higher levels of being that are no longer being held hostage by trying to um, 
defend against fear of death, fear of abandonment, fear of disapproval. You know, again, those fears come from someone who is not inherently stable within themselves, in their own perception of themselves. And, you know, again, it, we can say that conversation extends to your perception of death, what that is. Right. And when you look at it, you know, you could say, well, when a person dies, it's really a physical there's a physical death, which isn't death at all. It's a shift of energy. We just look at physics. The body converts into different forms of energy, decomposes. It does all sorts of different things. So the body doesn't necessarily die. But what does die is their identity, who they are, the name, how they identify with their body. You know, how so often when people identify as the body, that's where fear of death gets magnified. That if my body dies, I die, you know? So when you look at what I am, it's like, well, if you are the body, then you go with it, you know? If you see yourself as something separate from the body, as an essence or an energy or, you know, an expression, you could say, well, that's a human expression that is actually living in all humans you know I don't know we can go into deep deeper deeper thoughts about what death is and what it would be like to experience it and I'm coming from a position of experiencing it from my recovery experience mm -hmm. and I didn't know I don't think obviously I didn't experience a physical death a physical death but I I did experience at least the processing of death because I was preparing to die right Correct. yeah and for me that's where this recovery and awareness came from was actually getting rid of Robin you know how I identified myself as a body as a thin body as a superior thin person you know as someone that was inferior at its heart and had to attach to the body that way you know, um, as a failure to religion, something that God wouldn't love. You know, I had to really reconcile all of those things. And for the first time, in order to move on, I had to really value me, this the 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 essence of me versus the concept of me. They're very two different things. The essence of you versus the concept of you, very different things. Or one is just a fractional view from one point of view, you know, of me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like a, it's like a single spotlight look at who you are and then you attach to that concept. I don't, I don't know. And so when you look at death, it is often associated with the death of that identity. Right. It's something that you've thought about yourself the, your entire life. Correct. So you could say that you have gone through a death. There has been a death. What do you think yeah, that well, what do you think that well, is? You want it to come back. <laughs> well, if you don't want it to come back, then that means that you're not going to use it. So it really comes down to a position that you don't want anymore. So the what you have to do is you have to let go of what that position gave you. You have to say I don't want what it gave me. It's not worth the suffering. And what it gave me isn't um, as magical as I previously perceived it to be. It was it was a fiction concept. It was a fantasy. It didn't exist. What it gave me is an illusion to chase after, a mirage. So you'd have to want the mirage, right? Mm -hmm. And then it would be easier for it to come back up. So if you're having issues, let's just say with Body image, again, it's because you still believe the mirage exists. You don't see it as a mirage. You see it as a destination that exists. 
So the goal would be that you see it. It's a mirage. It doesn't exist. Even if you hit the destination, which is like being thinner, that is, you know, you could say there's physical destination. It doesn't, the, it, what you're fantasizing about doesn't exist because in order to maintain that destination, you have to perpetually live chasing it. So you really are just chasing a mirage. The destination is a fantasy that does not include all this insanity and work and all of these survival mechanisms around paranoia, micromanagement, perfectionism with food, isolation, oh. right? Right. All of the above. Exactly. So you have to look at the concept and recognize, well, that destination does not exist because it requires you chase after it. So it is a mirage. You cannot exist at that destination without the chase. So if you don't want the misery of the clutching onto it as it goes away from you, right? If you don't want that, you have to let go of what you think you'll get out of that. And it can feel like loss of love, loss of companionship. It can feel like no one will like you. You'll be alone forever. It feels like judgment. People will think you're inferior. And so you have to face all of those things that you've attached to the, to the destination. Uh, and the things that you've attached to the loss of that destination. And you have to go through it. Go, oh, yeah. It's not worth the misery. I don't want it. No way. And so you go into a space of, well, what is the body I'm in supposed to be like? If I get out of manipulating it, if I stop abusing it, if I stop relating to food as if I'm a victim and deserve the food, if I stop doing all that and allow the body a free space, a, a free space to manifest itself as whatever it is, will I be okay with that? You know, and the, what you have to go into because of our survival wiring is you go into your fear first. You don't go into what you wish you could get. I hope that it matches the the ideal. I hope it fits into those genes. You don't go there first. That's your bias. That's like gambling with losing a, a losing a you know probability. You go into how our brain is wired, which is to fear the worst case scenario, and you go into that worst case scenario, and you see if you can accommodate to it. Can you adapt to that? If the worst case scenario is that you're 10 pounds bigger than you are right now, naturally, meaning you're not binging, you're not overeating, but you are allowing yourself the freedom of reality or freedom of food that you enjoy, eating to the biological rhythm of hunger. So you're not really ever super hungry and you're never not super, you're never really super full. So you're eating kind of balanced and natural. If you end up 10 pounds heavier, that's kind of your body's natural state. And if you want freedom from having to manipulate it, you kind of have to accept that. If you're not willing to accept that, then you need to accept all the micromanagement it's going to take to get your body to where you can accept it. This is where this is a decision, and it is quite logical. Based on these emotions, right? Yeah, sure. Did you understand what I just said? Yes. Okay, because absolutely. You, yeah. Yeah, the, especially the part about the chase. Right. Like that, yeah, like you're, you're chasing it for so many years. Yeah. And then you get into recovery, and there can be times where the chase might creep into the back of your mind a little bit. You just need to just refocus. It's just a little refocus. Well, what it is is it's a, an awareness that, the the chase only exists if you think the destination exists. Exactly. You have to look at the destination and ask if it's worth the chase. Because that destination requires you chase it. So it's a mirage. I mean, again, it's like that destination does not exist. With the reasoning that you are using it for. There's plenty of people who exist in a thinner body without the insanity, but I guarantee they aren't emotionalizing it. They aren't magnifying it. It's not making them special. They are no, they're not using it as a survival need. So the question you have to ask yourself is why is being thinner 
necessary to survive? And is it necessary to survive? Do you really right. need it, especially if that need requires you continuously focus on it, seek it out, maintain it, manage it, defend it? Again, this was something that was hard for me to see until I saw it. Everything that I am doing is permanent because I'm not willing to surrender my thinness. So I can never let go of my obsessive exercise, my impulsive binging, my compulsive puking. I can never surrender those because I'm not willing to surrender thinness. Even if I hit the destination, I have to keep it. So I have, to, and keeping it goes against my natural biological physiology as a human being, as a mammal. So it is a moving target that requires constant perpetual defensiveness. And that's the downside of taking pride in something as narcissistic as thin supremacy. Okay. Is thinness really superior if it requires in that superior that you fixate on it, focus on it, defend it, manage it? constantly have to hold on to it. Is it really superior? Absolutely not. Okay, that's the truth. It isn't. The fantasy that you hold on to that makes you think it's superior doesn't include the insanity. It's like you're just thin, like it's a destination without work. Again, it's like hitting a you work 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 and you hit the destination and you're free. That doesn't that's a, that's a joke. You have to work 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 forever to keep it. Right. Mm -hmm. Don't forget that. that. That's the part I think a lot of people don't see until they see it. And then they go, well, that, I can't rely on that then for my survival because that is fucking miserable. I wouldn't want my worst right. enemies to be stuck in that at all. It's horrible. Right, because it doesn't always, if your goal is weight loss, if you, when you lose the weight, it doesn't end there. No, especially if... You then have to keep the weight off, which they call maintenance. Correct. And people are just as miserable in that. Correct. And it's actually not about weight loss. If you look at it, it's emotional. There's an emotional loss you're looking for. You're thinking, you're trying to lose shame, embarrassment. You're trying to lose a sense of inferiority. So it's really not about the weight. It's about all these emotions you're trying to lose. And then on the other side, you're trying to gain superiority, respect, trying to gain a sense of, you know, the things that you feel you're lacking, you're trying to gain. So it's all this, these emotions involved in it, which is why you gravitate to it all and why it's so intense to maintain it. This is why I say, you know, there's plenty of people out there who are thin who don't have all this crazy because they don't give a shit. They aren't narcissistic about it. They don't play superior with it. So they don't have all this damage with it. They just, it's a natural state of their body and they don't attach to it emotionally. Once they attach to it emotionally, there's going to be some behavioral, predictable behaviors that they will be doing to manage and keep it. They will be defensive. They will micromanage things. They will be fearful of food. They will, you know, and there's a balance around that insanity and then there's an imbalance around that insanity. Mm -hmm. Either way, it's suffering. It's just degrees of suffering. When people reach out for me, they're probably extreme, on the extreme end of suffering. People that are in that and aren't suffering that much would never be attracted to what I have to say because it's threatening, right? Mm -hmm. And I understand that. So everything I'm directing you to do is what I had to do, and it was hard, meaning it was hard to get to. But once I got to that place and saw this clearly, I... It felt like I was dying, and I let it let it die, and it's the best thing I've ever done. It's giving me so much freedom and so much realness. I mean, it gives me freedom to really connect, to connect with you, to connect with all the clients I work with, to connect to my family, to connect to uh, just everybody, really. Mm -hmm. So it's it's like um because I'm connected within myself. As a neutral person, it is equal to everyone, you know. All right, I'm going to stop recording. This is going to be a good one. You're going to want to watch this a couple times, especially the end, like the last half hour is going to be good. Okay.